All right. We are here back in the Fireside PM podcast with Jess Gilmartin from Calendly. Welcome to the show, Jess. Thank you, Tom. Uh, why don't we start? So I reached out to you because you had done a really interesting post on LinkedIn about uh, team culture as you took on the new role at Calendly as a CMO. And then later you did another post that became quite popular as well. So I, I would love to talk about both of them. But before we get into it, uh, maybe we could start with a little background about yourself. Sure. So I have been a CMO at Calendly since January, so um, not too long. But before that, I've had many, many years in tech marketing. So I kind of took a weird very convoluted approach to marketing uh, and my and my role. So I started in, um, actually I owned a chain of yogurt stores after business school um, and sold that and was very determined to never go into tech and that lasted for about 15 minutes. And then a friend of mine asked me to join his company as just a marketing consultant and just kind of fell in love with the startup world and was very lucky that company got bought by Google. And that kind of took me on a path of B2B tech marketing and I've done, um, B2C hardware, I've done B2B services, uh, but then I really realized that I love um, B2B SaaS. And so that's kind of where I've been for the past few years of my career. Love it. What is it that you that you like so much about B2B SaaS marketing versus other types? So I realize I love the collaboration with the salespeople. So I really enjoy just that immediacy of you, you put a campaign out and you see right away, like, does it resonate or not? Right? Mm. Are we getting leads? Does it do the salespeople? Um, are they able to turn those into opportunities? And I just kind of really enjoy that partnership uh, versus when I did B2C, it was more like you put a campaign out in the world and it was, you just kind of didn't have that immediate feedback, right? It was like people either bought something or they didn't, but you didn't necessarily know why. Mm. Versus in B2B, you know exactly why, you know what's resonating, you know what's not, you get like that very quick feedback. Um, I also, like I'm, I'm a very logical person. I'm a very data driven person, and so I like the, um, I like the way that you market to other marketers and to other salespeople and to sort of other people in this world, which is very much based upon sort of facts and data. And mm -hmm. you know, like if you have a product that provides value, then it's to be very easy to articulate that. And I, I kind of like that. Yeah. Um, whereas in consumer it's a little bit of a black box, like what works and, and doesn't resonate with the audience, right? It, there, it's not as much of a ROI kind of here's a theory of the case approach. Yeah, like, and, and obviously you have to have a real value, but some things just hit and some things don't. Yeah, and it's kind yeah. of unclear what it is. And so it's almost like a, it's very hit driven, right? So it's mm -hmm. like, why, do, why does one movie succeed and, and one doesn't? Sometimes it's because it's a good movie and sometimes it's just happens to be the right place, right time. And so it, it felt, it feels a little bit out, less out of my control versus in B2B, it feels something like something more in control. Like if I have really good messaging and really good targeting and I create really good processes, I, I feel like I have a better chance of being successful. Yeah. Even in B2B, do you, I, I've noticed there have been cases where um, one company has what I would argue is a superior product, but the marketing doesn't just land. And then the, its competitor like has like the giant booth presence and the brand and all of the thought leadership, but the actual product may actually be not as good. Um, do you ever, do, do you ever see, uh, like how big of a deal do you think that can be where, uh, you know, the marketing can, can drive the success of the company in spite of like a, maybe a third place product? Oh, a huge deal. And I would say it's not just the marketing. I think the marketing is really, really important. Um, I think the marketing is important in that it has a very clearly articulated story and they really understand their users and they tell a very specific story. So I think that that to me is one of the is one of the big differentiators is if you deeply understand what is the one thing that you're better at than anybody else and you just really stick true to that. Um, and you can always expand from that, right? So you could always sort of say, hey, maybe we're not good at these three things, but if we're incredibly good at this one thing, let's just find this customer base that values this. I'd say that that's a huge value. I'd say the other thing that I've seen is that if you have a much better sales process, you're going to be more successful. So if you have a sales team that is, um, that if, if you've created a really repeatable sales process 
and you have great outbound, you have really good data, you understand what works and what doesn't, and you're able to scale that across your salespeople. That to me is absolutely um, the number one path to success, even if you don't have a great product. Wow. So for all those uh, PMs out there, our work is not, uh, <laughs> it's really, it's, it's, it's a supporting actor. <laughs> That's not true. Um, I will say, I mean, I have been in the situation where I had, I would say, a okay product and an amazing sales and marketing team mm -hmm. where, where it gets you is on the renewals mm. and the retention. Right. So you, you have to have a great product to retain and expand customers. So uh, it's incredibly important to have both good products and good sales and good engineering and market the whole thing together. Appreciate, appreciate, appreciate that. <laughs> we have a question, a live question, actually. Uh, wondering if Jessica can comment on how it's different in her experience from B to B to C versus, I guess, B to B. Yeah, so I've done all of it. So I did. I've done B two B to C and B two C and B two B. So I think B two B to C is really challenging because you are relying upon intermediaries to be able to effectively tell your story. So really, in B two B to C, you have to give the intermediaries, right, the B in this case, you have to give them the information, you have to give them the materials, and you have to give them the training and hope that they are able to you know, get those out in the way that you have asked them to. And mm -hmm. so I think for me, the big difference with B2B to C is that um, you have to treat your partners almost like they're internal employees where you have to hold them to really high standards and you have to have a pretty strong quality control so to make sure that they are doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. Because the, the thing that I've seen often that happens is that, you know, people think, oh, I have these partners or I have these intermediaries, these channels, and I'm just going to give them a bunch of stuff and they're going to be just as incentive as I am and just as motivated and just mm -hmm. as confident as I am at distributing it to their consumers. That's just the reality is it's not the case. And so you have to make sure that your incentives are really strongly aligned. Your um, your the materials you give them are really bulletproof and that the training you give them is really, really strong. Yeah, totally. Well, let's hop into the original reason for uh, for me inviting you on. I'm going to share my screen so everyone can see. So you posted this a few weeks ago when you had uh, recently joined Calendly. And you talked about this notion of uh, culture bugs. And uh, for, let's start there with, because it, it sounds like before you rolled this out, you spent some time with the leadership team as well. What was that process like? Uh, what, why did you decide to do this? And t just tell us a little bit more. Yeah. And, and by the way, this is not just at Calendly. This is at every single marketing team I've ever worked with in my entire life. So this, is, this is 10, 15 years of working with marketers and understanding what are the things that they're really good at and what are these things that I just persistently see over and over and over again. Um, and so I think for, for me, it was, it was actually really interesting. So I, I started to see this too, right? I joined in January. I am very, very lucky. I have a great team, right? You never know what you're going to inherit right. when you come into a new organization. Um, I inherited a really strong team with some, I would say some uh, bad habits, which is very, you know, it's, it's, common and I, I wasn't surprised. And so what I was thinking about when I joined is, hey, what are the things that are really great? And what are the things that are these bad habits that we want to you know, understand and figure out how do we correct? And this is the same as I've done in every single organization I've ever come, come into. And I started noticing these persistent things over and over again. So I think one of the, the biggest jobs of a leader coming into an organization is just understanding why do things get done and why do things not get done? Right. So my job is to say, like, you know, what is what is happening? Um, what are what are good things that are happening and what's holding us back and trying to. And, and so what I did when I joined is I interviewed every single person in my team and it took weeks. But I literally went through every single person and I talked to them and said, you know, what are the um, what are the things that you love about your job and what are the things that are really frustrating and what's holding you back? And I and I gained a huge amount of insight and intuition about what were the challenges and what things that came up over and over and over again. And so it was pretty clear, things kind of fell into a few different categories. And then when I talked to my leaders, they would also kind of persistently bring up the same things, right? So mm. I still remember one, one of my leaders, when I was talking to him, he was like, I just want everybody to know this. <laughs> and he's like, you know, I was like, I don't understand why I can't get people to ask why more. Um, and because he's 
just intuitively does it. Right. Mm -hmm. So he literally will, will, um, slack me at, you know, Monday morning. He's like, I was thinking about this all weekend and I don't know why your SMB leads aren't uh, converting like they used to. And, you know, and then he's, and then I was like, great, dig into it. Right. And so he digs into it and digs into it and finds out, he found out this reason, which is the same reason that most things happen is that we made changes and didn't think it through. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, then, and, and it's the same thing in my, another, uh, one of my leads, when I, I was talking to him, he said, you know, what's really frustrating is that I feel like people are not having the right kinds of crucial conversations. Like they're not able to have difficult conversations and understand, you know, uh, and, and feel comfortable calling each other out in a respectful way. And so these, these sort of things of like my intuition and then what I was hearing from my leads kind of coalesced to say, hey, these are the bugs that I'm hearing about all the time that we need to squash because I know that they're holding us back from being as successful as we could be. Yeah, the crucial conversations thing, I think it happens uh, across functions. You know, it's a challenge, especially since, uh, you know, we tend to want to encourage uh, psychological safety and uh, respect and collaboration. And that can sometimes be conflated with, oh, well, then we shouldn't disagree on mm -hmm. hard things. Uh, how do you manage to maintain kind of that safe, positive environment, but also have, you know, some of these hard, gnarly conversations? Yeah, it was really interesting. I was uh, speaking to this company a week ago. And they were asking because they were they were having a theme of empathy and they were asking me about this. And what I realized is that when I was when I was speaking to them and they were asking me about kindness and candor and empathy, mm -hmm. I realized is that people mistake kindness and empathy and they mistake candor and meanness. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was a really sort of interesting aha moment for me is that people think that when you are direct and you're giving people feedback, that that's mean. And they think when you are empathetic and you don't speak up, you're kind. And I actually like, and, and I make it a very clear point to say that that is not the case, right? The kindest thing that you can do is be direct mm -hmm. and give people feedback because that makes them better. And I think one of the most unkind thing that you can do is not be direct, have strong opinions about things, disagree, and then not express them because it doesn't make anybody better. <laughs> And so like, that's something that I just share all the time. So I think number one is just making sure people understand the value of being direct and mm -hmm. the value that that brings to the organization. The other thing that I do is that I reward uh, directness mm -hmm. and I specifically call it out. So an example this week was that somebody had expressed um, some disappointment around a way that I had been sharing information, right? I just was sharing some information about a, an, um, a campaign or, or an initiative and she felt like I was being really disrespectful to the work that she had done. And obviously mm. that was not my intention. But when I heard about it, I was, you know, I immediately grabbed some time with her. And the first thing I said was, thank you so much for sharing this with me. Thank you for sharing this feedback um, because, you know, now I know not to do that anymore. And so immediately addressing feedback and thanking the person and publicly acknowledging that somebody gave feedback, um, expressed concern that creates psychological safety, right? Like the people know mm -hmm. that when they speak up, not only are they not going to get punished, they're actually going to get rewarded. And does that apply? How do you think, uh, that applies to, um, tough conversations that aren't necessarily about individual kind of behavior or style, but more around like projects or strategy? You know, I think we've all been on those, in those situations where, um, maybe people have reservations about a decision and, you know, but no one wants to really challenge it because maybe there's inertia or they know it's, uh, you know, near and dear to, you know, key kind of leaders, hearts and things like that. Mm -hmm. How do you approach those situations? That's where asking questions is going to be your best friend, right? I mean, that actually where really is where empathy comes in because what I, what I'm seeking to understand is I'm, I'm going to try to change somebody's mind. Right. And I think that that's like that's a trap that a lot of people get into, which is they feel like in these conversations, it's it's a win loss. Mm. Either either I have to go in and change somebody's mind and, and one of us is going to win or lose um, or I have to avoid the situation completely because, again, I don't, I'm afraid of winning or losing. 
And the, the way that I always approach these conversations is, you know, what's the right thing to do for the company? And I'm just seeking to understand. And maybe I'm wrong, right? Like maybe the way that I think about the problem is not correct. And maybe there's information that I don't have. And I'm interested in understanding that. So one of the principles I live by is, um, I think this is Jeff Bezos, principles of strong convictions weekly held. Mm. It's one of the things that I most strongly believe in, which is I'm going to have a point of view. It's probably going to be wrong and that's okay. And I'm going to seek to understand why it's wrong. And then I'm happy to change my mind. And so going into these conversations where projects may be off track or I don't understand why somebody has a, a different opinion, I'm just going to go in and ask a bunch of questions and I'm going to learn. And then I'm also going to understand, you know, what, what does, what would it take for them to change their mind? What information would they need? Mm -hmm. And what information would they need to maybe try something my way and see if we could, maybe it's, Hey, let's try this other thing and let's gather data and then we'll see if it's working or not. And then we'll switch. So it really, to me, is all about asking questions and being really curious and not seeking to win. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And and to your point about uh, strong conviction convictions weekly held, do you uh, how do you how do you see applying that approach as a as a CMO? Um, I'm sure a lot of people look to you as you know a key thought leader in the company. And so if you have a strong conviction on Monday and then let's say new information comes about and you change your position, uh, there's a risk that they could be like, well, what to happen? Like Jess was so for this thing and now she's not like, you know, it's, 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 um, kind of jarring. Mm -hmm. Have you, how do you approach that, that, you know, that risk? Yeah. And when I think of strong convictions, I don't think of coming mm -hmm. in and I'm like, Tom, if we don't do this, I'm going to quit. <laughs> right. Like that's not the strong conviction to me. All strong convictions mean is that I don't want people debating and discussing things for weeks and um, and then me sort of not having an opinion and letting mm. these endless debates happen because you you know I mean that happens a lot in organizations is there's just there is inertia as you said and people mm. will just endlessly discuss things and then never make decisions and that's to me that is the worst thing you could possibly do as an organization I would much rather be wrong fast than mm. be right slow and so um, and usually you're wrong slow and that's even worse. And so the way that I sort of approach it is that, you know, I say, hey, it doesn't matter what the decision is. Let's just make a decision and let's recognize that it may or may not be wrong. And then what is the information that we need to put together in advance to, to know whether this is right or not? Right. So the, the thing that I think a lot about and that I direct my team is let's decide if we're going to do this. Let's have a strategy. And then what are the data? What are the um, what's the processes? What's the reporting? that we're going to put in place to know as quickly as possible if this is successful. And then let's change. And what I, the, the expectations I always set with my CEO and my peers is, hey, there are some things that I have strong conviction on there that I know are working. And those are things that are tried and true. And there are a lot of things that we're just testing. And we don't know whether they're going to be successful or not, but we're going to try them and I'm going to come back to you and let you know if they were successful or not. You know, one thing I've seen a lot with marketers is that they really don't like to say when they're wrong and they kind of paper it over mm. and they're like, oh, we, we did this, you know, we, we went to this event and we got all this leads and it was super successful. It's not fooling anybody. The sales team knows that those leads didn't turn into sales. <laughs> so why, you know, why are you even pretending? So I'll be very, very honest and say, well, we, you know, we, we had this conviction, right? Right. I, we believed that events were important for us and they were a great strategy. We tried five events. We generated a lot of leads. They didn't turn on, into opportunities. This is, you know, doing a postmortem. This is what we found. And then this is what we're doing going forward. And it just builds a lot of credibility. They, they know that I'm going to be very honest about what's working or what not, what's not working. Yeah. I mean, that makes such, uh, so much sense. And I could see how, um, you know, it, it increases the credibility and, and then you could have these difficult discussions in the future and they know that you're kind of by the numbers and by the facts kind of thing. And yet, um, you don't see that that often, that behavior of an honest retrospective on, on, on many things. Why do you think, you know, it's people are smart that work at these companies. Like, why is it so uncommon? 
I think it's really uncomfortable. And I think you have to have a lot of confidence in yourself and your team to be able to have these really converse, these really difficult conversations. It's, it's, you know, it, it, it's not like I, um, in the first part of my career was comfortable mm -hmm. doing this. I mean, this is something that I have learned over time. And in the earlier parts of my career, I was very defensive and I absolutely would have been the person to say, no, no, but look at all these leads, you know, <laughs> because you, and, and I think marketing in particular, it sometimes can be hard to prove the value. Mm -hmm. And, and I think when, um, and especially we don't have perfect data, we don't have perfect attribution. And so I think a lot of marketers can get really defensive and feel like, Hey, I have to prove my worth by right. showing all of these metrics. And these are the only metrics I can show. And so you, I think it just does come from a place of defensiveness and feeling like you have to protect your team. You know, marketers are always worried about getting their budgets cut. And mm -hmm. so I think you have this feeling that you have to constantly demonstrate that you are providing value and, um, and so that your budget doesn't get, get your head count doesn't get cut. And so I think having that really, close relationship and that trusted relationship with your CFO, your CSO, your CEO, I think to me creates an environment where you don't have to be quite so worried and quite so defensive. Makes sense. Let's go to your next point about creative problem solving. Tell us a little bit about, about that. So that is one that, well, it's so funny. Everyone I look at, I'm like, no, this is the most important one. <laughs> this is the most important one. <laughs> They're all the most important ones. Uh, so the creative problem solving, and, and as I said, the, the thing that I realized with so many people is that they, they have this very black or white, and it's particularly so in marketing. So what happens in marketing all the time is that you are launching a campaign or you're thinking about doing something or you need this report and there's a blocker. There's always a blocker. There's always something that is is stopping you from doing something, whether it's, you know, legal is concerned about something, whether it's you don't have the data, whether it's um, some another team, you know, can't get to it until two months from now. And what I have found with so many marketers is they just accept it. Like 99% of the time, they'll just say, well, we can't do it. Mm. And they wait and they're like, okay, well, you know, X person can't send this email for two months. So we're going to wait. And my philosophy has always been, I think just because I was an entrepreneur and you know this, Tom, right? You have to break through every single possible wall mm -hmm. to make things happen, right? I mean, can you imagine when you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to get your business <laughs> going and you're like, oh, well, the lawyer said, the, you know, she can't get back to me for three <laughs> months. So I guess I'll just sit here for three months. Um, and, and that is to me, one of the most, you know, sort of deadly ways you can think about running a business because you just, you have to be creative and you have to think of alternatives. Um, to me, one of the best examples of this was when I was at Asana and there was a um, woman on my team that ran our operations and uh, legal was very concerned about the emails that we were sending. And they required this, they, their first, you know, sort of um, recommendation was requiring this crazy double opt-in that was completely infeasible. And most people were like, okay, let's just do it. And she said, hey, you know what, let me get on the phone with them and under, understand what their concerns were. So she asked, again, she like was empathetic. She was curious. She found out that they had this very specific concern. And she said, mm -hmm. oh, can we just add a line to the bottom of the email saying X? And they're like, yeah, that's fine. And she solved <laughs> it, right? And that's a perfect example. And, yeah. and I can come up with a hundred of these and you can too, of where somebody just asking questions, seeking to understand why, or seeking to understand, you know, is there, if, if this internal team can't do it, can we outsource it, right? Mm -hmm. Can we find a team that can take over a lot of these, you know, small tasks so that we can get something done faster? It's just very basic stuff that I just don't see a lot of people doing. Yeah, that's another interesting one where you would, you would, ar you could argue that, hey, um, we hire great people in, in all these companies and um they're measured by performance so they should be motivated and incented to be creative and and find a way um and yet uh i have observed that as well in in you know in previous situations where people are willing to take no for an answer to very early versus like the how might we kind of creative approach mm -hmm. um why do you think that is? Cause like in education now, like we're always 
emphasizing this, you know, for in schools and, and grad schools and, and kind of creative problem solving. And yet it's not as common as one would hope it is. Maybe the next generation will, will do this more yeah. because, you know, project based learning was not mm -hmm. a thing when we were growing up. I mean, we, we just learned mo rote memorization and we were rewarded for being the smartest person as in we knew the most facts. Mm -hmm. So none of us were rewarded or none of us knew how to do creative problem solving. I certainly didn't. The only way I started knowing that was when I was at Dell, right after business school and everything was a robot. I couldn't, I couldn't get anything done. <laughs> I had to learn it or else I literally could not do a single thing in my job. And so I think it's just one of those things where we're, and there were, by the way, there were plenty of people at that company that didn't do that and they didn't progress and um and they just kind of you know they they took a took no for an answer and you could be successful doing that and i think the people that end up being very successful and the people that end up being in leadership positions are the ones that are creative problem solvers so i think it's a i think it's a triangle mm. right with the vast majority of people at the bottom that just don't ask those questions and i don't think that they're particularly successful and then there's a small group that are able to do that and i, I think they're the ones that that end up being in the in the leadership positions that reminds me, uh, my oldest son, Ryan, is a counselor at a, a, a robotic summer camp for middle school kids. And he was complaining to me. I was like, oh, so how's your team? Because, you know, he has this team of like uh, seventh graders or whatever. And uh, he's like, oh, I'm kind of disappointed. And I said, oh, why? And he said, well, I we're sitting at the table and I'm explaining this task that we have to do. And he says, um, so, you know, who is who has ideas on how we should how, how we should approach this? And it was just like silence. Um, and so uh, hopefully by the time these seventh graders, you know, work at a company, they'll they'll have that intuition to to try and be creative and, and come up with with ideas and solutions. So they're starting early in, in kind of project based work, but it doesn't maybe it doesn't come naturally to everybody, too. Right. I do not think it comes yeah. naturally to everybody. And and I yeah. think asking these kind of questions is asking a lot of people. I, I don't think if I sat in front of even my best marketers and asked that question, nobody would say yes, right? So I think you have to, yeah, you know, and maybe you say, Tom, what are your ideas? Yeah. You know, how do you think yeah. that we should approach this? Do you think that we should start with extra, not that I know anything about robotics, so I should just completely stop talking right <laughs> now before I make myself sound very silly. <laughs> Yeah, it could also be no people may not want to be the first one because they don't want to be like too aggro. Yeah. Um, so to your point, maybe I'll I'll give uh, uh, Ryan that tip. Hey, next time maybe call on someone and because maybe they have an idea, but they're just um, a little uneasy about being the first one to jump in. Yeah. All right. Let's look at the next one, which is going the extra mile. Say more about that. Yeah. So that. That to me is is very, very common in marketing. And it's still a huge problem with my team that I'm trying to solve. And I think one of the particular issues with marketing is that it's almost like an assembly line. Mm -hmm. so if you think about how marketing works, you kind of have one group that is responsible for generating leads and one group that's responsible for making sure those leads get you know routed and one that's responsible for scoring and mm -hmm. one that's responsible for nurturing and one that is responsible for content. And so each of them are thinking about their own little world, but they're yeah. not thinking about how this all fits together. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I, what I see often is that uh, someone will run a campaign, they'll run, they'll put out their content and they'll be like, great, I did it, right? And they're like, okay, we, we ran a webinar, we got 500 registrants, success. And they'll report on that and say, hey, isn't this great? We got 500 registrants in a webinar. But then who's actually responsible for seeing mm. that that turns into revenue? There's nobody. Nobody Nobody in marketing typically is responsible for that. And there's somebody that's like creating the reporting for it. And we're talking about it. And we're getting frustrated by it. <laughs> uh, but nobody's actually thinking about the end to end. And so that that is a, just a fundamental flaw in the marketing sort of structure is that it is like an assembly line. Every person is putting a part in a car, but no one's actually responsible for making sure that the car works and that people wanted the car. Yeah. And do they get rewarded for that? Is this an incentive issue? Like maybe if they're earlier in their career, like, hey, I'm the guy or the person that's 
going to do the report and I'm going to do the best report I can. And that's what I'm here to do. And I'm going to get promoted next year yeah. by doing lots of these reports. Yes. I mean, that's exactly yeah. right. And if you look at OKRs, it's actually really hard to tell somebody, hey, you know, you're responsible for the reports and you're also responsible for the outcomes. And yeah. Like, well, how could I be responsible for the outcomes? I'm not the one that makes the content. I'm not the one that makes the, the webinars. Mm -hmm. So that's why the going the extra mile and asking those questions is so unbelievably important. Every single person along that chain has to say, uh, okay, is this being used? You know, the, the person that's creating the content has to ask the questions. Is this being used? Okay, is this being used? Is that then generating revenue? And if not, why not? And who do I need to talk to to figure out what we need to change? And the person that's creating the reports doesn't just need to put the reports out, which is often what they do. They need to say, oh my gosh, I've seen that, you know, we used to have a MQL conversion rate of 10% and now it's 5%. Why? Mm -hmm. And then they need to be detectives and look into it. It's very, very uncommon to find those people. And those are the ones when you find those, there's usually 10% of your organization is like that. And you reward the heck out of them when you find them. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's also true in product where sometimes you're, you're like in some meeting and then some PM says, oh, like, uh, I didn't, th I wasn't asked to do this, but I was looking into this thing. And I noticed this interesting trend here or mm -hmm. this interesting metric that kind of made me wonder what was going on. And it turns out blah, 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 blah. And those are like step change kind of meetings where you're like, oh, wow, that's a, a whole new insight versus kind of the, uh, the, 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 the kind of train just running down the tracks, you know, through inertia. Um, so it's yeah. It's amazing when you find those people. <laughs> totally, totally agree. Uh, what about influence? This is a this is an interesting one because you know marketing is all about influence. Marketing is all about getting your cross-functional partners to do what you need them to do, right? And uh, and and actually what what's best for the company. Mm -hmm. Because you have not only do you have to influence everybody within marketing because all of us have to work really, really cross-functionally to make things happen, but you have to have strong influence with sales and with product. And so it's one of those things where uh, if you don't have a really good sense of how to influence others, it's going to be really, really frustrating for you. And so I think the and I, again, going back to what we talked about before around people thinking influence is I'm going to go in to win mm. and you're going to lose. For me, influence is about coming in with a really deep questioning attitude of I need to understand. I want to understand, you know, why you think the way you do. And if you're right, then I'll change my mind. And if I feel like I'm right, then how do we get to a place where we both agree and feel really good about it? And I think there are a lot of people that can influence by making other people feel bad about it, right? They just direct things. They just say you're going to do things. They go around others, right, to force decisions. And that's not the way I would ever want to work. I would never want to work in an environment where I either say yes to everything or I force other people to do things that they don't want to do and they're miserable. Like who wants to work in an environment like that? So to me, influence is about how do you create win-win situations where everybody feels good about the result? And I, and I think it's possible um, by listening and being really empathetic and by coming up with solutions that everybody feels good about. Let's talk about the product management marketing relationship. Um, what's what's been your experience in terms of how uh when that works the best and like some common challenges in, in, in that particular dynamic to me the most common challenge is that marketers will just say yes to everything the product managers want <laughs> which tom you're like terrible well, <laughs> uh so i mean that that's more common than not which is the marketers will just basically be ticket takers and the product managers will say, hey, we're launching this feature, this feature, this feature, this feature. And then the marketers are like, okay, they have their checklist. We're going to do a blog post and we're going to mm -hmm. do a press release and we're going to do some social posts and we're going to do sales enablement. They check, 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 check. And we've done a release and everybody says, great job. That to me is a very unsuccessful partnership. And I think the partnerships that are very successful are when product marketers are involved in the very beginning 
understand the product, actually have some say in how to think about the development of it because product marketers are very, very closely connected to our customers and they should mm -hmm. have an opinion. And then they together scope the launch and they figure out how do you put different features together to create a much bigger story. And that's something that we try to do a lot. And, and when I came to Calendly, that was some, the first thing I did, which is, you know, let's take the all the features that are launching and let's figure out what are the themes that we can tie together to create something bigger. Uh, and then, you know, maybe not do five product launches in a quarter, but do two and do them really, really well and tell a much bigger story that ties to something that customers care about. You know, it's not just, hey, Calendly launched this feature, this feature, this feature. It's, hey, these are the challenges that you have right now. These are the struggles you have right now. And this is how we hope to solve them through all of these great things that we just launched. I have to put a snarky joke in about, uh, but if you group all of the launches, what if, what if that delays a launch uh, at, to be after the perf period is <laughs> over? <laughs> It's true. I mean, that is a very serious consideration. But you know, and honestly, that was that was an issue. That was an issue with mm -hmm. our team because, and not not because of Perf, but because they had our product team had KRs around usage for their yeah. features, and so that was a concern. And so we had to have conversations with them and have to come up with ways for them to, you know, maybe even change their um, their development cycle so that we were able to launch in a way that they were able to still see the results within their KR. So you do absolutely have to take these things into consideration. Yeah, it's such a soul crushing moment when uh, uh, in the in the in the sort of last 10 years, let's say, I was in a conversation where we was like, Oh, this, this product, this feature is not gonna, it's not gonna work the way we thought it was, we we should probably pivot it. And put our resources into something that's way more promising. And, you know, one of the responses was, well, the, uh, the engine manager has been working on that for the last 18 months and, uh, he's up for promo Oof. and you're just like part of you as an empathetic leader, you're like, okay, I get it. Uh, on the other hand, you're like, well, there's a lot of people working on this project and we could be doing other things that would be more beneficial to the company. And that, that is a tension that is, uh, un, you know, definitely uncomfortable and, and delicate yes. to navigate. Well, I think that's also, you know, perhaps the, not the right promotion strategy. <laughs> I won't say yeah. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, <laughs> let's go to the next one. We could all do a whole podcast about incentives and yes. culture. Yes, we um, could. <laughs> prioritization yeah tell tell us more about that yeah this What's is a take? biggie with marketers and what i have found with marketers is that there's two flavors of marketers there are ones that say yes to everything and then they are crushed with work and they complain oh, all the yeah. time that they um have way 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 too much work and then there are the ones that um adhere slavishly to the priorities that were set at the beginning of the quarter of the year and then just say no to everything that has come after that and i would say the it's more like nine to ten 90% mm -hmm. of marketers just say yes to everything. 10% just say no, because, well, we already have our list. Uh, and neither of them are great, right? Like you don't mm -hmm. want your team killing themselves. And you also don't want your team not open to changing priorities because things change, the world changed. And so what I always coach my team is to say yes and. So if, if uh, a sales team or product team comes and says, hey, we have a... Um, we, we would love for you to do X. Like we really, what we're seeing, and one of the great um, examples for, for us at Calendly is we're seeing huge uh, interest from financial services. And that wasn't the case, you know, even six months ago. Mm. And so the sales team was like, hey, can you do more campaigns for financial services? We absolutely, I mean, we should totally go to where our customers are, but that means that we have to look at our existing priorities. And so rather than saying no, or rather than saying yes, and all the other stuff we're doing, we go back to the sales team and say, hey, these are the things that we agreed on in the beginning mm -hmm. of the year. What should we take away now? What's not important? And then we let them make the decision. And so we're like, great, we're going to do financial services. We're not going to do this. You can do that with absolutely everything. Just like with the product team, right? The product team says, hey, I actually need you to launch this thing, or this is now a tier one. Mm -hmm. Great. We can absolutely do that. What are we not doing? What did we agree was important? And what are we not doing anymore? Incredibly simple. Very few people do it. Love it. 
Yeah. And speaking of the product marketing thing, uh, just building on your earlier point around bringing marketing into the product kind of strategy conversation earlier. Um, one thing that I have found as a product lead when working with different marketing teams is if they can bring data and an insight that shows I might have a blind spot or we may have a blind spot or, or there might be an opportunity that we hadn't thought about. Uh, and it's grounded in facts and like research versus like, oh, I, the marketer, have an opinion, but it's like, no, we've done this assessment or we did this survey or we did this, you know, we looked at this competitor and they're getting a lot of traction doing this thing. Um, that goes a long way to influencing that, that road mapping process. Um, and it, it kind of goes to your other point about, you know, the people who are curious that ask why that kind of dig in. Yeah. Um, that can be a really magical partnership. I know we're way over time. I will ask you one yeah. last yeah. question, Jess, because yeah. it is, it is 2023. So we have to talk about generative AI. <laughs> Obviously we have to talk about generative AI. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> are you, have you started using any gen AI, um, any, any results so far, or, or are you taking more of a watch and see approach? Like what's, what, how's it working? I don't think you can be a marketer and not use AI at this point. So we're, we're obviously not using any of the open source tools because we don't want to put any of our proprietary data in those, mm -hmm. but we're finding really interesting, you know, we're, we're definitely using the writing tools to, to and, I, and I'd say what I find interesting about AI is helping to generate lots of different alternatives. Mm -hmm. So I don't think AI is, is in, in the near term going to replace a good writer. It, it's not, to me, it's not good at creating existing content by definition it's just yeah. taking other people's content and putting it together but what i love about it is that you instead of paying a writer to come up with a hundred variations of an ad yeah you come up with three variations of an ad and you ask ai to come up with the other 97 and the thing that i actually really love about ai which i i think is much better than humans is that you can really dial in the tone mm. that you want and they will nail the tone and it's actually really human, difficult for humans to nail the tone. And so when you want to test, you know, hey, do we want to be more conversational? Do we want to be more formal, more funny? Mm -hmm. AI is a great way to do that testing. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Most of us think of AI as like, well, I'm going to ask, you know, Bard or ChatGPT to compose this this memo or this this ad copy, and then I'll see how good it is. It sounds like what you're saying is like, no, I want to see the the 20 or 30 different outputs and, and look across them, use that as inspiration or, you know, uh, uncover something, you know, an approach that maybe you hadn't considered right away. And it, it's more the breadth than actually like, give me the answer and I'll just take it. Yeah. I mean, if that's how you're using AI, I don't know that that's going to be successful. AI will not give you the answer, but it will give you options. And, and but just like marketing, by the way, Marketing is all about testing and it's all about experimenting with many, many different versions of the same thing because there's no way that we can judge. I've never in my entire life been right about what ad variation or copy variation is going to work. Never. And so the what you have to do is just go out and test five things, 10 things, 15 things, and then you'll get your answer. Love it. Um, anything else that, uh, that you want to share before we wrap up, Jess? This has been... A great conversation and i'm so glad that uh we we're able to have it yeah i appreciate it and i've enjoyed looking at your aquariums they're very soothing <laughs> that's right uh I, I, if i ever open a dentist office like this will be perfect <laughs> waiting room uh well thanks so much and uh well hopefully we'll get you back in the future and folks if you're watching this uh on replay put in the comments if you have any other topics that jess and i can hit for uh for the next time she's on the show Perfect. But, yeah. Well, take it. Take care, Jess, and have a great weekend. Thanks, Tom. You too. Bye. Bye.